You're listening to the Southampton Delivery po- po- Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. <laughs> If you want to have guarantees, you have to buy a washing machine. Okay, with a stupid Henry! We don't lose a match, either we win or we learn. And today we learn. Abdacha, Hawkins! Shot at Gizabi! It's in field to Mare, 25 yards out. Lovely ball for Pella. Onside! 1-0! Blue foul shot! Like Bambi on ice. It would be very, very embarrassing to watch. And now, and now, now your, host, your host, Matt Markstone. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast and newsletter dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans and available right here on SouthamptonDelivery.com. My name is Matt Markstone. I am the host of the show. And no matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thanks for making the show part of your day. I hope that you enjoy it. And there was no match for you to enjoy over the weekend with Saints third round FA Cup match against Shrewsbury being postponed. Um, We held off recording the intro, so hopefully we'd have some uh, some sort of conclusion, some sort of news as to when or if that match would take place. But as of now, there hasn't been a decision made, so we are not sure. It sounds like one likely option could be that our match against Leeds in the Premier League midweek uh, could be moved to allow us to play that third round FA Cup match. Um, otherwise I don't know. And, uh, that is one thing we discussed on the show this week with Chris Hutchings is the fixture congestion. This might, uh, present as saints go on and, and exactly how saints tend to cope when matches come thick and fast and, uh, kind of what that might mean for us. So, uh, Chris, who you can follow on Twitter at Hutch FM, and I will discuss some off the pitch matters, some on the pitch matters. Chris does some data and analysis for Opta. So we bring that in. He, often follows the under 18s and, and the B team as well. So uh, we'll talk about all of that and uh, I hope that you enjoy it. And we're sorry there was no match for us to discuss this time, but uh, you know, that is just what it is. And so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can. And hopefully next week we have a match to talk about. Hopefully we have a, a victory to talk about and um, yeah, let's get to it now. Once again, you can follow Chris on Twitter at Hutch FM, follow this show at SFC D E L L underscore I V E R Y you've been listening a while and you're enjoying the show, please do consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. It helps new people find out about the show. And I very much appreciate it. Um, also several of you sent in emails over the past couple of weeks. Thank you so much for those. I appreciate it. Uh, I am working through getting back to them or back to you on them. So uh, let's do it. So uh, that's enough for now. We'll talk to you on the other side. Here's my conversation with Chris Hutchings. Thanks for listening. I'd like to welcome back to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, Chris Hutchings. You can find him on Twitter at HutchFM. And even if you aren't in the stadium, you can uh, see him uh, just below the TV gantry or in the TV gantry, uh, filling in stats for Opta. So, Chris, welcome back. Uh, thanks for your time and uh, happy belated birthday. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, pleasure to be back. I was going to say got over the birthday, but um, it's a lockdown birthday. So not too many options this year. You know, I, I was kind of like... When we started the lockdown stuff, I was like, my birthday is not till August. So definitely, you know, we'll be okay. And then it's like, my birthday comes and it's like, well, my daughter's birthday is not till December. We'll be okay. And she's like, can I have my friends over? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, you can't. Um, so we're, we're postponing the birthday. Uh, she doesn't know this. We postponed one birthday uh, a long time ago and then we just never did it. But she was so young, she forgot. Uh, my mom has not forgotten. Uh, she's never let me forget that. But um, hopefully you, you enjoyed yourself, even though it was... Uh, uh, a bit of lunch, and he said some some takeaway and glass of wine, and you were warm because you were due to be um, in the stadium uh, for the FA Cup match against Shrewsbury, and and you didn't have to do that, and so no double no double socks, no gloves, no just nice warm wine, overall decent night sounds like. Yeah, good. Stayed on the washing bill, but yeah, didn't have to wash three go. layers of clothes. Yeah. And uh, you probably got to bed at a decent hour as well. Versus uh, yeah, yeah, not too bad. And and that just means that the uh, the win we got last week, uh, early last week, meant uh, that that was that was the last thing Saints did for your birthday. So that that win was for you, and maybe that's yeah, why definitely. Ralph was crying. He found out he wasn't going to get invited to the party, or or he knew how old you were going to be, or there was no cake. One of the two. All of those things could be uh, reasons he was he was shedding tears, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, so I guess just you know y- you have a, a role 
in in football and it's not your your full-time job but you do uh do stats for opta and so you're you're often in the stadium and uh, we've talked about how fortunate you feel to be able to do that um but i mean just COVID has affected football in, in so many different ways and uh, obviously you know the the way people are viewing football now the fact that matches are being canceled and all that stuff but um, from from your perspective, uh, what what's been the kind of the biggest impact that maybe me sitting here in America maybe I haven't thought about in terms of, um, you know, how, how COVID has, has impacted football in, in in England? I think the first thing was um, obviously we had the, um, the stoppage, the first lockdown back in March, we had a three month break before um, football came back, um, and for me the Premier League coming back the Saints and a few more games along the way um, as well across different leagues and, and things but I think the first big impact was obviously the fans actually going to a game behind closed doors which then became the regular and it has been the regular now for painfully to say that seven months since we first played behind closed doors yeah um was a big impact um fans were kind of teased a little bit by coming in twice at St Mary before Christmas and um, before the lockdown came back again um, I still think that's a massive impact and people are feeling that. I think one worry of football will be that people will drift away. Um, we've had problems in this country with people drifting away in the summer from uh, sports like cricket and going off to play golf when that was allowed and cricket wasn't. Um, will people fall out of love with football? Um, I'd like to think not. You know, for most people, if they if they tag onto a team when they're a kid or a bit later in life, they hold on to it and they stick with it. And um, we've got wall to wall football. If, um, if you subscribe to uh, Amazon, BT and Sky in this country, you can watch every single Premier League game at the moment. So in terms of TV watching, it's uh, and probably for people who wouldn't normally go to a game, maybe try and do it for work commitments or just can't afford to get out to live games because it's uh, not too cheap these days, especially in the Premier League. Right. Then the wall-to-wall football is probably a godsend early on, but... Um, just to kind of just get a feel at the moment and a few things mentioned um, in the media recently that is it becoming a little bit hollow? It's a little bit, the situation with COVID is really picking up. We've got massive um, figures coming out over the last um, couple of weeks and, it, and the predictions are that's going to continue going up for at least the next two, three weeks. Um, so football feels like it's hanging on a bit in there, keeping people's interest. Um, January transfer window coming up, of course. But um, I do wonder with the players as well how they're. You don't really hear too much about how they're feeling playing in front of the um, empty stands because for them it's become the norm. And a lot of players comment when you hear them interview normally that they say, oh, you know, you can kind of shut out the noise once the whistle goes and you're in the mindset of playing the game. So I still think the fans are the, are the big thing. Obviously, the financial side, as we mentioned a lot, has been. Uh, uh, a lot of money sort of pushed down towards the, the football league recently. So things are going along, but um, football's just been really disjointed with the COVID effect. And um, I think that's starting to really kick in after that initial euphoria of getting football back. The massive push to get it back. It's now um, football's got to just kind of hanging in there to keep going. Yeah, well, I remember, you know, back when we went on our, we kind of, went home from work here and then there was this, you know, I had all this time and it was like, well, there's, there was no football on because they, we had taken that break. And, and I kind of, at that point said, you know, I wish, I wish selfishly there was football going on because I have all this time and I wish I could just do it. And now, like you said, they've, they've staggered all the kickoff time. So almost there, there are very few games that are playing at a, at three o'clock on a Saturday, uh, which means that you can watch games all day long if you want. And even here I can start watching at four or four o'clock in the morning and watch all the way until two or three in the afternoon when the, when the 8 PM kickoff for you guys is over. Um, but it's, it, it does feel different. And I'm, you know, I don't always want to watch the game. Sometimes I just want, I want the, the kind of that mess of the table moving around at, at, at 3 PM on a Saturday. I, I want that happening as goals are going in and things like that. And, and to, yeah, I, I'm, I wanted to watch the, the, the Carabao cup, you know, um, semifinals and just, you know, at, at noon on a Wednesday, it's kind of hard to justify to my kids and wife. Like, hey, I'm going to sit here and watch this. Um, so it, it, it's definitely different. And, 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 and you, you mentioned, you know, the fans are really, 
bearing the brunt of this. A lot of fans still would have had, um, you know, would have, would have paid in advance for their season tickets. And and there's, I think Southampton have been decent about uh, refunding people and things like that. I think I'm not a season ticket holder and, and stories are conflicting. So I'll, I'll leave that to people to, to make up. But um, as you said, it's not, it's not cheap to go to games, definitely not cheap to watch them on TV either with, with the three TV subscriptions and things like that. And, um, and yeah, but you mentioned the players a little bit and playing in front of the fans, but also, you know, they've been asked and I don't, I know they make a lot of money and, and all this stuff, but they've been asked to kind of, you know, really secure themselves inside their bubble so that they don't put their teammates at risk. And we've seen, uh, you know, especially Manchester city players. And I think some, some Arsenal players uh, on the women's side uh, went to Dubai or something like that over, over Christmas. And, and I think there was some marketing stuff that they were doing or whatever, but it, it, there's a, there's going to be a fallout from that. But we've seen people act irresponsibly, um, not can I mention any names, but Kyle Walker, Benjamin Mendy. And then um, we've seen, you know, our, our team kind of, you know, we haven't heard anybody doing anything like that. Um, and still, you know, McCarthy winds up, um, you know, you know, contracting COVID. And we were talking before we started recording, you know, I was a little worried because Fulham had that outbreak. Um, they had have, they had a games postponed and things like that. Scott Parker wasn't there when we played them. Uh, and somehow Alex McCarthy winds up and it wasn't from them because they didn't get anywhere near the goal. Um, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it is worrying, but the, so you worry about the players in terms of, of, of their health and their families and, and the, the kind of restrictions we're putting on them. Um, but then you also have, you know, the staff that, that are going to be effective. We ha- I've seen uh, quite a few uh, people that work for, for saints in different capacities kind of saying, you know, it's been a great so many years and I don't know if they're being asked to leave or, or anything else, or they're choosing to leave. Um, but it doesn't seem like the time uh, you would want to be uh, seeking employment elsewhere. If you could, if you could, you know, secure a job, I feel very fortunate that I've, I've been able to, to keep mine. Uh, I know a lot of people are not in that situation, so um, it, it's been different. But I, I guess the the real question and the, the biggest concern is is the safety of everybody, whether it's it's the the fans or just you know the general population uh, and the players. I mean, at this point, do we do, do well, I mean, do we keep playing? Do you do you see foresee a, a potential stoppage? I think it was Neil Warnock, who I don't think I've agreed with on very many things, kind of said, you know, we. This is something you need to do. This is gives some something for the people to look forward to, and 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 this is you know at a time when we're all trapped inside our houses. Essentially, um, you got to give some people some escape. And so, I mean, I, I guess it's a, we have to find a balance there, and I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, it's an ever looming debate here, really, over whether football continues. I know uh, when Sam Allardyce came in at West Brom, I think the first game he mentioned the fact that he felt like there should be some sort of fire break, like a two week break. And then you've got a lot of opposition um, from some fans and media over the fact that he was a 66-year-old man who joined the Premier League Football Club and fit right into that situation and then made a comment about it should stop. But, um, <clears throat> and probably West Brom fans wouldn't mind things stopping at the moment. <laughs> well, it doesn't take uh, two, le- two weeks to turn to tell the guys to set up and, you know, uh, 442 and lump it long. Like, that, it, we, can, we can figure yeah. that out in about two hours, I think. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of feeling because the numbers are um, ramping up on positive tests. Um, vaccine is a, obviously the big push um, in this country and across the world as well in terms of who's going to get the vaccine. There was a story came out this week about Sean Dyche at Burnley mentioning just making a comment about um, footballers being vaccinated, not necessarily to go above other people in the in the pecking order, but. Um, whether that would keep things going and keep, you know, the kind of the big amounts of tax contributions that football makes to the government um, viable and it's got some stick from that. Um, and I was reading yesterday in the Telegraph here in England, Steve Bruce has, has come out and been pretty straight said that it's morally wrong to force footballers and staff to continue working because of the way that the new strain of the virus is spreading now. And obviously Newcastle Road Club, who were hit quite hard, they had um, two of their major players, the Sales, who's just on the way back. And so Maximum is still out and expected still to be out for um, a few weeks yet to come back. So, um, you know, Steve Bruce, an established manager, experienced manager, has come out and said, when you when you mention the words, it's morally wrong, that really hits a call with a lot of people. And it, you know, got into the into the sports section of a major 
national newspaper here. Yeah. It, and it does feel the, the testing is being ramped up. You know, the Premier League have, have gone to two tests a week. The Football League here are going to two tests a week in this week. But that won't stop people catching the virus. Right. So it, personally, I, I can completely understand if football did stop because it almost feels like everything else is grinding to a halt and being stopped. And there's an argument that why should football be any different? I, I appreciate, you know, you mentioned Neil Warnock and it's great to be able to have that release of people coming home or being at home and stuck at home and having that release of watching football on the TV. But should it continue if other things are, are stopping, people are losing their businesses, massive financial impact? So would, in the very least, you know, a short fire break be a, a decent um, a decent thing to do morally. Yeah. As, um, Steve Bruce says. So I think that argument will ramp up in the next week or so, definitely, because things aren't getting any better here at all. Well, and to me, at least, just thinking about it, I know a lot of teams, you know, you mentioned taxes and, and the money that, that flows into, uh, you know, through taxes into the government and things like that. But you, you think about, you know, we can we can continue to play games behind closed doors and, and those TV companies will continue to, to reap the benefits of that, those advertisers. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned you're going into the stadium still. And and when you do that, the the difference between you going in um, on a normal day where you fight traffic and park a ways away and, and walk in, as you were mentioning to me earlier versus now where you drive right up and you, you know, you basically, you don't have to a lot, a lot of time. Um, that means that, you know, the, those 30, 32,000 fans are not going to the pubs. They're not stopping by the shops. They're not doing those things. So even if we continue to play football behind closed doors, we talked about it being a little bit hollow uh, maybe before we were recording, but you know, we, I think we run, we run the risk at some point of, you know, it, it, us just playing games doesn't bring back that feeling. And there are, there are going to be a lot of businesses around the stadium that are going to, to, you know, possibly not be there. And, and I know stopping football doesn't, doesn't, uh, you know, guarantee us that we're going to get those back. But it, it, we, it, if, if we stop playing matches for a while and that could speed up the, the time that we come back to play in, in full stadiums, um, maybe we, we could, you know, increase the likelihood of some of those other businesses and the local economies kind of, um, you know, coming back stronger and, and, or at least being preserved a little bit more. And, and I guess that, that's what I worry about because I think sometimes we, you know, the big companies get to talk about, you know, the revenue they're losing or how, how they're dealing with this. And, and even though I know it's, it's millions or billions of pounds and, and I start to feel a little bit bad that they're losing money or whatever, because I feel for people, um, you know, the, the guy who owns a pub or a bakery or whatever on the way to the stadium, we don't get to hear that story as often. And it's, um, and, and I think that's probably, you know, they're, they're actually probably going to employ more people in Southampton or, or in Brighton or wherever than, than sky sports ever will. And so, um, or BT or whatever. And so I think that that, that's a bigger, I think that's a bigger story for, for me or a bigger impact for me. And I don't know how to fix it. And then, and I just, if, if us somehow taking time away from football so that people can get vaccinated and I know there's, there's issues with, with that and everything else, but you know, if we can get that back, I think that that's probably, I would, I would make that trade, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I agree. I think it's difficult being in the thick of this and because it's become, there was a lot of talk last year here of the new normal. Well, after 10 months, it's become the new normal, yeah. the way we're living in at the moment. And I think you're right to, to take a break away or to step back and look at the, the big, big picture, you know, even in, of this country, to take a break away from football to re so then in the long term, if in two, three years' time we look back and think actually taking that short break from something that fundamentally isn't essential to everyday life to get people back on their feet. And as you say, if you, if you looked across the amount of um, money that's generated locally through all those guys who, who park in a car park, you know, half a mile from the stadium, a mile from the stadium, they walk, they walk for half an hour from the, train station you know they pick up a coffee they pick up a pie 
they grab their lunch on the way to the ground. Um, if, you, if you add that to the, or you put it up against the, how much is being generated around the stadium in terms of um, the burger van, the program seller, I think that amount around the ground and around the locality and the local businesses, and also a lot of these people are fans as well. You know, they're fans, they want to contribute to football as a, as a uh, national and global business. That would be, I'm sure that would be a real eye opener to people how much money is generated indirectly from football. Yeah. So, um, it's just kind of biting the bullet and saying, okay, a break, even if it's a month or two, in the long term, that will not be a long time. Right. You know, we, we've already had a break of three months and football got back. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> what you don't want to do is end up looking back in two or three years' time and thinking, well, that guy's um, sandwich shop or that guy's coffee shop is now being taken over by another business. Yeah. It's become a piece of, you know, a piece of real estate that's moved on. Yeah. And, and, and the, the TV companies aren't looking to, to recreate those jobs, you know, and, and they are thinking about, you know, can we keep our advertisers happy? And, and I think there's probably a knock on effect as well, because those local businesses are also they're going to be the ones that support, um, you know, the Southampton Women's Football Club, not the one associated with Saints, but uh, the one that's been around since since the 70s. And, you know, those all of those players pay to um, to train. They have to pay for, for time on the field and all the stuff. And so they, they look for sponsors. And if those local businesses aren't there, they already struggle to get some of the players struggle to get um, sponsors. and you know, you start taking those local businesses away or maybe the people that have a little bit uh, of extra income from their business or from their job and now they don't have that and they can't sponsor them. And so there's there's definitely a knock on effect, I think, that that, that could, you know, take a long time for us to, to realize and see. And I don't really want to, you know, I don't I don't want to imagine that, but I guess uh, that's kind of what we what we have to do. Um, but. You know, I don't, I don't know. And for the time being, uh, obviously, the, the Shrewsbury game was, was was postponed and there will be an announcement sometime early. Or you, you may know the, the, the result of the announcement by the time you hear this episode on, on Tuesday. Um, but whether we play that game or whether we, I, get to, I guess, get to go through as a, some result of a forfeit on their, on their behalf, um, you know, then we'll find out what, what, what we get to do after that. But it just kind of makes me think when you just going back to the businesses, Matt, thinking that... Um, I'm gonna. I'll mention one lower league club um, just down the motorway from us called Portsmouth. I've done a few games over the last couple of years. One thing that makes me think about clubs like that, you know, maybe maybe the championship to an extent, but definitely League One, League Two, the National League here, is that when you open the program up, you've got most of the players are sponsored by local businesses. And when you mentioned about um, Southampton Women's team um, looking for options. Of sponsorship locally, it's that similar principle where you might go to a League Two game like Crawley, who are playing here at the moment, open the program, and someone's sponsored by, you know, John Smith's Carpentry Company. Um, <clears throat> that might not mean a lot to you, but to that club, that income, you know, it could be five hundred pounds, thousand pounds plus a year, yeah. is vital. If those businesses go and they can't feed that money into the local club, yeah. then and that's replicated across 24, 48, 72, 100 clubs yeah. in the country. That's a real problem. And I yeah. think maybe looking down the league, you see that picture a bit bigger. Yeah. And I just, you know, it, it's going to have an impact and it's had an impact. And I think, you know, I, I think we have also seen that, that Premier League clubs and championship clubs are not immune from this because some of them are run pretty poorly in terms of how their finances work and stuff like that. So we've seen what a razor's edge they're on already. But then you go down, you know, you're still talking millions of pounds, uh, you know, one side or the other, but go down to Eastley or whatever. And the, the margin is so much thinner. Um, and, and so to, to risk that. And, and when you, when I talk to people online, you know, people, when you could go to local football again, even if you, you couldn't get into to a, a, a Premier League game or a championship game, people were going out to those things. And, there's only 400 people there anyway. So you can stand all around the stadium and you, and people are in and, and that. I think that means a lot more to people than sitting at home and watching a Premier League game where, um, you know, I, I don't really want to watch Brighton V Newcastle, you know, like that's, that's not a match that I'm really interested in sitting down and watching. Uh, and, and, but you, if you can go and watch your local team and, and you see the, 
the local sponsors and all of that other stuff like that, that, that means a lot more to the community. Um, and, and I mean, that's what football was, right? Football was, a, was the, the people's game to, to a large yeah. extent. And it's, it's a working class sport. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And I, we don't need to get all probably philosophical, even though we've probably done that for the past 20 minutes, but, um, it's, it, you know, it, it is important. And, and I think so much for me is trying to understand how that game, because my, obviously my, I was brought to the game through, you know, the big media companies buying the rights and putting it in front of me and saying, Hey, you know, I'm the, I'm the target demographic. And, and I, I fully realized that, but, um, I think it's always important to, to remember that that's, that wasn't the original intention, right? Like the, this game belongs to communities and you look at even the origin of, of Southampton and, and, and the team and, and where it came from it, it, there's a lot more there than just, Hey, we're on sky sports at eight, you know, like that's, that, there's a lot more to it. And so hopefully we, I ch- try to keep that in mind as much as we can, but we, we can't talk about a little bit of football. Um, you know, you've, as you mentioned before, been very fortunate in terms of getting to keep watching the team and keep seeing the team. You're one of the few people that's been able to, to, to see live, live matches. Um, and, but you also kind of been getting to see uh, the, the, the under 18s, I think a lot of the time, and, and you've done a couple of uh, under 23 games as well. But um, I, I guess when you, when you look at that and, and when you're there, I, why don't you just remind people, you, but you, we talked about it before, but when you go watch the under 18s, what is your job? What are you doing? What are you looking for as you, as you sit and watch those matches? And we'll kind of talk about the impact of that. Well, my job is a, as a opera analyst in under 18 games, a lot, a lot different to a Premier League game. Premier League, there's guys at the other end of the line who are watching a feed, live feed of the game, and I'm kind of filling in the bits they can't see on camera, and giving them a bit of a heads up on, you know, free kicks coming up and throwings and things coming up and stuff that's off camera. When, uh, especially, it's kind of seen quite recently that you know when Sky want to show four replays, and um, the guys at the other end are not knowing what's going on in that, in that time, especially with uh, the way Ralph's been. Uh, getting the team to play that in the time that Sky played three replays about a, a shot missing, um, McCarthy's played it out, it's gone all the way across the back four and back again. So I'm kind of filling in all those gaps here on the guys at the other end. Okay. When we go to an under-18 game or 23s, I'm the eyes, I'm the complete eyes of Oxford in the stadium. So I've got my pitch grid with numbers on um, and basically reporting every change of um, possession, every foul, Every corner, every throw in, every goal kick, every goal with this, yellow card, red card. So, um, it's pretty intense to do that. So, um, so yeah, you're watching the game intently in a, in a different way to a fan would watch it, even in a different way to when I used to commentate a few years ago. Uh, you watch it because I'm watching the ball and the ref. I think they're probably the two, um, two people and objects I'm watching most of the time, where the ball's going and what the ref's doing in case he uh, whips out a sneaky yellow card or, you know, the offside flag goes up and I call offside, he's actually waiting to play on it. So, yeah. So, um, so yeah, you kind of watch it in, uh, in that way, but also you get to watch, I think that's one thing that's come out of the way that Saints are playing at the moment as well, is that you get to see the system as well. Okay. And the way you kind of get used to, you know, number three always takes the throw-ins on one side or number seven always gets to take you know, the corners for the under 18s or, you know, we have a running joke for the Premier League games and the, the guys at the other end that um, if Paul Prowse doesn't take a set piece, they'll probably hear me fall off my seat <laughs> in, in surprise. So, yeah, the under 18, 23 games, they're, they're quite intense in okay. terms of the way you watch. Yeah, and, and so do you have to worry about every single pass or you are as often more worried about change of possession? And I guess, I mean, we... Opta sells all those, all those stats, right? And they, yeah. they turn that into stuff that... Um, you know, uh, you know, they, they turn it into an immense amount of data that, that people broadcasters can actually use. But uh, do you have to worry about every single pass or is it more just change of possession and things like that? No, 18 and 23, basically the contract includes change of possession, okay. free kicks, corners, throwing, okay. goal kicks, goals, assists. Thank so, yeah, no, so no, that, yeah. would be, um, that would be far more intense. So I, I can't ask you how many, how many touches our central midfielders have for the, the under 18s. How many touches yeah. what Cakes, Cakes Chalk has had this season? Or, yeah. No, not quite. I did get asked that. That's probably one of the questions that people ask me quite a lot. Or oh, can you tell me any passes so and so's had? And, but there's a guy at the other end who will tell you. Right. Or, uh, but, you know, they, they don't really need that as part of the contract for 18 and 23. But then again, you also remember that 
every team now, even down to that level, even lower age group levels than that will have an analyst in the yeah. ground. So there, I mean, there's somebody employed by the team, essentially probably doing almost the same thing similar, you're doing. Yeah, very similar to me. But yeah. but for internal use only, um, which is not usually what's written on the bottle. But uh, yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> it's a bad joke. Um, I kind of think of what I'm doing is more of admin use for them. Yeah, and they're kind of technical use. For them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess from your time watching those players and seeing them live, um, I'll be honest, I haven't <laughs> resorted to watching uh the pl2 matches here um sometimes i put them on if i'm at work and i just have to clean the classroom or whatever it is but uh you know who has stood out to you as you've kind of watched these guys kind of develop over the last couple of years um that's quite interesting actually because it this is my third season now so um when i my first few games were all under 18 under 23 games so in those early games you had the over femis the valeries uh, Kane Ramsey, um, players like that, Bockins, Smallbone, um, Callum Slattery, Josh Sims were playing in that, that level regularly in the 23s. And um, younger guys who are even being mentioned now, like um, Alex Jankovic, who's quite highly um, touted at the moment, midfield, young midfielder. He, he was around in under 18s at that time. So, um, so as you kind of naturally see a few of those guys come through, there's obviously far more being pulled through by Ralph um, because he came in, Ralph came in December of that first season that I worked for Opta. So you started to see people like um, Kane Ramsey, Tyreek Johnson, who um, we might mention later on because he's, a, uh, looks like he's on the move this um, January. He actually played his first uh, two Premier League games under Ralph early on. Almost one of those who was plucked immediately by Ralph to um, try out on the first thing. So, um, yeah, quite a few names have come through. Um, I see more of the under 18s now, and that's obviously a big jump. You, you know, you'd have to do something pretty spectacular to jump up. Um, I think one person who kind of made me sit up and think of uh, where there is that pathway now from the 18s up through the 23s is Egg Chalk, who turned up on the bench. We're in the um, very unfamiliar number 72 on uh, Monday night, I think, to the fourth. And a lot of people, you know, scratching their heads around uh, the TV gantry about who this guy was. But, um, and that, I think that one substitutes bench really showed what that pathway is about and how Ralph wants to feed those kids through, where it could be argued that we've had a number of years where it's, it's gone down to a trickle, really. You can count on one, one hand those players who come through all the way through after the, the kind of batch of the, um, you know, the Wolf Prowls, like so Chamberlain, Callum Chambers, um, those guys coming through, whereas it, it's now really picking up. So, um, yeah. And you, you can see, I mean, it's uh, quite interesting that even with the, the, the teams lower down, they didn't necessarily play always in the, in the same formation as um, the first team do. Um, sometimes it's a little bit different. You know, the um, the 18s quite often will play a 4-4-2, but sometimes they'll play with, they normally play four at the back, but they might go to a diamond in the field and they tweak it a little bit. And you kind of think, will they mirror what the first team were playing? But I think it's more about players in terms of their desire, their work rate, the type of football they want to play, even if the formation is a little bit different to what the first team are playing. Um, it's players that can be versatile. You see quite interesting in the 18s. Um, it, they do, you do see players switched around uh, quite often between the, the attack, like the, the four in midfield, the two up front will rotate between mm -hmm. games. And it's almost if they're going to try them out in different positions and, and not focus solely on the result, but look at what guys can do in different parts of the pitch. So um, I think that's, that's something that I know as a, as a parent with a 12 year old boy who's played football now for six, seven years, that's a really important part of youth football. Yeah. And even up to that age is to keep trying, don't, don't um, stereotype someone into a position necessarily. It could be that you move them on place to the right or you move them forward, you move them from midfield up front or you move them from centre back into central midfield and it just clicks and it works. So um, 
I think you can see far more of the, the development in, in the, um, the pathway there now. And that, that really came out in that bench that came out on Monday night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there was probably nobody better suited to, to look at that bench in the stadium and, and go like, hey, I, I know those guys than, than you, you know, who haven't been watching them kind of come through. So um, I know we, we, were, we were joking earlier. It seemed like it was a bunch of children and Shane Long, and that prompted the question, you know, which, which Saints player would you leave your kids with? And I think we said Shane Long would be fine. Like, we, we would do that. Um, obviously, former Saints player, I wouldn't leave my kids with. Charlie Austin, gone to QPR now. <laughs> Uh, probably not. I don't need my kids to be down at the races. Um, you know, they come, so back with blonde, come back with blonde hair anyway. Wouldn't they? There you go. There you go. Uh, I take Charlie Austin, as we said a long time ago at a, at a, at a music uh, festival. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, not sure. I'd take my kids to that though. Um, when, when you see this, there was a, I think a comment from the new owners, was it Burn, new Burnley owners who said, you know, we want a, a, an academy or a system like Southampton used to have because theirs is dead now. And, and Dan Sheldon in The Athletic uh, promptly rejected that, as I think he, he should. And you mentioned there was definitely a lull. I think if you look back at, um, you know, Kuman wasn't happy with the academy system. He kind of stopped using those and wanted, I think that's part, kind of where the fallout started is he started to demand we spend more money to, 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 kind of be successful right then and and that was never going to happen and so you and, and ralph kind of you know went into lockdown and you talk about the last time when we had this break and he came back with this playbook and said this is what we're doing and, and as you mentioned you can kind of see that developing you would see them trying players um in different positions because how are they going to fit in that system and i think that's you know that's the best thing we could we, we could ask for is because we're guaranteeing we're not guaranteeing but we're we're building towards the likelihood that we can be successful in the long term rather than, and even if it, they don't make it all the way to the, the Premier League, those players are going to become more valuable to us as we sell them on once they, you know, sign a professional contract. And, and even if they don't make it to the first team, they, they you know, will likely have um, careers, you know, in, within the championship or League One or League Two. Um, and and, and that, I think that will be important to the long-term economic uh, future uh, of the club, I think. Um at least that's that's how it works out in my mind. I'm not sure if we'll have to see how it goes, but I think we're we're building back towards the right way uh, for us to do things rather than um, having to buy a you know a however expensive center back or, or central midfielder because we we know we're just not going to do that probably. Yeah, totally. Um, I think in terms of the way we play at the moment with the going back to the playbook and the way Ralph sets the team up, you need players in that team in that system who are going to play out of position. Because the way we shift across the field, we end up with effectively like four at the front. You end up with Armstrong, Walcott, Redmond in the kind of inside position. You get Walker Peters coming in off the right and being inverted and coming inside. So he sometimes will end up as a, not as a right winger like you will um, most fullbacks or wingbacks these days. He ends up in the center of midfield. And playing balls off of um, Romeo and more Prowse rather than playing balls off of the, the front men. So um, I think you need players where they are going to be versatile and comfortable in different positions. And this, and you know, it's still said that we've got a thin squad, even though we've got some decent youngsters on the way through. But if you've got a, a thinner squad, but players who are versatile and can shift positions, then we saw it with Valerie on Monday night. He came on. Everyone knows him as a right back, and he effectively played as a right winger, uh -huh. and looked pretty comfortable and almost um, nutmegged Allison in yeah. the process to score a goal. So, um, so yeah, players who can work within a system and are versatile and play in two, three, four different positions. That looks like to be part of that playbook that, um, and the way forward for us. Yeah, and I, and I think their development as as overall footballers, not as you know a right back or as a, you know, left-sided center back, but as, as a, as an actual football and the understanding of the game, I think that will, that'll improve the team overall because all of a sudden you learn a little bit more about, Hey, it's a lot easier for me if for my other center back, if I take up this position, um, you know, or if I deliver the ball, you know, to the, to their right foot rather than their left foot here, that makes, that makes their life a little bit easier and turns them away from pressure or into pressure. And it just kind of gives you a different perspective. Uh, just having that understanding, I think, will will help players move move on. Just trying to make sense of it to myself here, but um, I, I guess when you watch those players, because we as fans, we you talked about the thin squad, and, and you look at uh, how we're going, and in, in terms of injuries and COVID and all this stuff, 
how far are most of those players at the under 18 or under 23 level or B level? How far away are they from being ready? Do you think? And I, I'm, I realize that I'm asking a completely ridiculous question, but suppose you've got the under 18s and the players, especially into the 23s, you've probably got two options on how to develop them. If you develop them through your own system uh, to a point, you've also got the loan system to use as well, whether that's going to be valuable to them to go out on loan. But then we've got players, um, people like Josh Sims, who's been out on two or three loans. But is he going to be knocking on the door when he comes back, if and when he comes back to the club? Who knows? So, you know, and players who get to 22, 23, and I go, really kind of going nowhere within our system. Um, but actually looking at the players who were there on Monday night, um, they've all got a part to play. I mean, small bones being in, being effective at times. I've got to say, Teller is quite direct and looks dangerous. And you can tell one big advantage from the, um, from the empty stadium is being, a heel, being able to hear Ralph. I was going to say Ralph and his coaches. It's Ralph, really. He's um, calling the shots. But they're very positive shots that he calls. And he's really encouraging to all the players, whether they're, you know, the 18-year-old or the 33-year-old um, Shane Long, um, about the way they're playing. And uh, it's a demanding system, but he isn't overly demanding verbally with them. He will give them a lot of credit. So they know if they put the, put the yards in and the effort in um, and try and use the system and try things within it, you can tell that that is okay with Ralph and he's, he's given credit for that. So um, I think with all those players, they're all just looking at Lindeloo, Bockins, Teller, Smallbones, and Valerie. They've all had, you know, minutes in the Premier League. And um, yeah, I think they're pretty close. I mean, just thinking about the, the system we play, I said about uh, Carl Walker Peters is integral to that, the way he plays off the right wing um, as an inverted uh, fullback. But that's balanced up by the fact on the other side, you've got a kind of steady Eddie Ryan Bertrand who doesn't get too far forward too often. Um, whereas if Bockins comes in on the left-hand side, well, he's put, if he matches Bertrand, he's kind of just going to be steady. If he does more than that, which he's capable of, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he scored a goal in the FA Cup last season, was had a pretty decent game in that one against Huddersfield. If he does more than Bertrand in that in, in that um, sense and comparison, then that's an advantage to the team. Mm -hmm. So I actually think within the system, those more experienced players, we've seen Diallo, who we've got to remember is still a really young man. He's come in and done a brilliant job on Monday mm -hmm. for Romeo. So I think in terms of the, the players who, who may be uh, pushing on age-wise and those youngsters might come in and fill those spots, um, it's pretty positive. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that I mean, that's encouraging. And I, I hopefully it, it continues and, I'll, I'll have to rely on you as my eyes and ears for the for those guys because they come through. Um, and I'll be honest, like you know, when that when that lineup came out, it we kind of looked at you know, and went, I I'm not sure who this guy is. Some of those people, I've never heard of some of those people, which is not not great considering I've been doing the show for four years. Um, but also, some of them were 12 when when the show started or 13. So, um, you know, that's that's different. Uh, you, you talked about Ralph on the sidelines and and being quite vocal, uh, quite emotional. And his reaction to the win over Liverpool uh, drew some criticism, drew some different kind of takes on, on things. And, and I kind of was only going to briefly mention in the newsletter and it wound up being the entire uh, thing that I wrote. Because I, I don't know, before I go into it, what, what was your reaction to that? Um, as you saw him, you know, the whistle goes, uh, he's kind of down on a knee. You, there were definitely... You know, the the wind was in his eyes or whatever it was. But what I mean, what's what's been your reaction to, to I guess to the, the reactions of people around around Ralph's kind of uh, outward show of emotion uh, at at the final whistle? Um, I think people have got to put it in context really. You know, the situation we're in. Uh, Ralph had obviously come through a situation where he missed a game uh, because of the COVID situation at home. <clears throat> you know, it takes a lot of effort to come up with a plan to beat the reigning champions and team who were. Uh, who won the Champions League two seasons ago. That must take a lot of effort mentally and physically uh, to go through that. So <clears throat> I've, I've got no problem with it at all. 
And there's a lot of people who in normal times will say, we want to see a lot more emotion and feeling from players, especially, you know, highly played Premier League players. You know, we don't want to see 11 robots running around for our team and just scoring and then, you know, just getting on with the game. So I found it quite refreshing. Um, maybe if every manager was going down on their knees in tears after every game, who knows? But I, I personally think trying, trying to detach myself from actually being a Southampton fan and seeing a guy who clearly cares for the club from top to bottom because, you know, he's got a lot of young lads coming through. He also met, he put um, effectively 11 guys who come through our academy in a squad of 20 against the best team in the country. He was going to catch up with him and he is an emotional guy. You hear this player speak about him. He's a guy who gives everything. So um, I think it, was, it was, wasn't unfeasible it was going to happen at some point. Those emotions would come out. And um, yeah, I've got no problem. It's great to see emotion in football. It's um, great to see people celebrating goals. And you know, you see players cry at the end of games and they don't get too much stick for that. So I don't see why a manager should when, um, when the plan comes together. Yeah, and I think we, we, we spoke about things being a little bit hollow, right? You know, and, and if, if the stadium's full and St. Mary's is absolutely rocking and, and that, you know, or if we score that goal, you know, in the 91st minute or whatever, then nobody says anything probably. But because the goal was in the second minute and it was, um, it, which I think actually makes it, you know, uh, makes Ralph's reaction more understandable because, you know, when we scored in the second minute, I kind of went like, oh no, like how are we going to defend for, you know, 88 minutes or 87 minutes against these guys who, you know, and, and so I was, I was worried and, and, you know, for Ralph to have to manage that game and, and he had never beaten Klopp and, and there's all these kind of things that, that he has a lot of respect for him. And, um, they did the coaching badges together and all this stuff. So when he, he shows that, I don't, I don't really have a problem with it. And, and as you mentioned, there's, there's a lot of context to these things and, and, I don't, I don't, I don't, I just, I just don't have an issue with it. Um, you know, if it happened every game, maybe it would get old after a while. But um, I also think that, you know, when, when Klopp came in, people were criti- criticized him for taking the the team over to to the cop and, and, you know, doing the, the arms up in the air and yelling and people criticized Hasenhutl for doing it as well, because it's just a league game or it's just an FA cup match. And it's not, you know, you didn't win a trophy. You didn't do this, but it's, it's not about that. You're trying to build something else. And, and I think, you know, some people criticizing uh, Hassan Noodle and saying, you know, it makes you appear weak. I think I think that's just a kind of a product of how we were all raised in, in, the, in that. But um, it's also, you know, Ralph has to know he shows that to them and to us. And he he knows what the, the potential consequences are. There are going to be some people in the squad who are going to go like, I don't quite understand that. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. But Ralph, obviously, I think we we've seen is a strong enough personality to say like, this is me. And this is, this is how I, this is how I am. And, and if you don't like that, we can talk about it. And and I'm not going to be scared of that or, or whatever. And I think, I think, you know, he's done enough to earn the respect of the players in, in that dressing room. So if he wants to show that he can, if he didn't do that, if he wasn't putting in the work and wasn't, um, you know, if that was just a, a, a if that was shallow and, and hollow and everything else, and just doing that for the cameras, um, I think the players would react to that differently but I, I don't feel like that's the way i don't feel like that's the reason he's doing that if that makes sense yeah i totally agree i think um especially for a, a modern man like we are matt to show um emotion in that way isn't showing weakness it's actually showing openness and honesty and there's no pro- i've got no problem with that at all and i'm i'm pretty sure most of the fans wouldn't if there was, as you said, if there were um, there were thirty two thousand fans in the stadium and we scored, even if we scored in the second minute and then ended up beating Liverpool after you know a fantastic defensive display, mm-hmm. I'm sure there'd be um, several thousand of those fans in tears themselves as well. Yeah. So yeah, I've got no problem with it. It's, it's someone being open and honest and not showing that he cares for the club. Just those feelings just come out and yeah. are shown. And um, I I don't really see how people want to get on a bandwagon and not that yeah. I'm sure a lot of them will want to see that from their own club. Yeah, absolutely. You, you want, you want somebody who cares. You want somebody who is that committed to what, what is happening. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Ralph. I would probably support him even if he cried after every match. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't understand this. And, and then, you know, you get to the, the guys on talk sport and, and everything else. And you just realize, you know, for me, they're, 
they're just doing it to try to, as long as people are calling it, if people are, I, I, I fell into it. I clicked on the video. I watched it. I commented, uh, I, sh- which means I, I, I spread their message and, um, you know, people are going to tune in tomorrow to see what they say. So, um, that, that, that's what this is about when, whether that's a good business model, I don't know. Talk sports seems to have 8 million channels over there. So I don't know what's going on a- anyway. So, um, let, let's get on. Obviously the, the transfer window is open, uh, which my least favorite time of the year, uh, there was initially, um, you know, some links for Obafemi going to Swansea. Uh, he just posted yesterday, uh, that he, there's been a surgery. So I, that, I think that, that, that moves probably off as long, depending on how long that takes. Uh, we were talking about earlier, we, none of us, neither of us have seen anything really concrete as to what happened to him or whatever, but, um, and maybe by the time that this episode comes out, we'll, we'll know a little bit more. Um, but let, let's talk because we've, we've seen potential links for loan moves and, and everything else. Uh, I think the only uh, official one so far is Tyreek Johnson's joined, uh, Gillingham, which I believe is league, the league one or league two league one. League one. League one. Um, so, you know, he'll have a chance to play against the guys down the road, I guess. So hopefully he scores. Uh, but he had a pretty good uh, loan spell over here in the States. Um, did well, was exciting to watch. Maybe is still in that in that mold where he, first team game time at a lower level, better for him than than working with, with the under-23s, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think if someone can play, you know, competitive level, um, it's an advantage if they're going to play regular football. I think it was, was a heartful that he played four over in the States. Ye- yes, Hartford, Hartford which is where Ride Ride Jaidi. Yes, Ride-y-jay-di. yeah, but it but that's a kind of manufactured move, I think, because they're an affiliate of Southampton, whereas this is a you know going out to some of these uh, clubs that aren't really linked with us. But if he can get regular football in in uh, League One, then uh, it's only going to build his confidence up in terms of whether I think what you mentioned earlier was was really important in terms of whether he comes back and is part of Ralph's plans. Or if it gets him a move to a championship team, a League One team, and really cements his career in professional football, then that's part of the, the point of it. If we get a fee for him and he moves on, then that's a better route for him. You know, who knows? We see players go down the divisions and then come, out, come back up mm-hmm. later on, either by promotion or they play themselves into a move back up right. the ladder. So, um, yeah, I think going out to, to play at Jimmy and then League One is um is a decent move for him. Uh, we've seen with um I think we've probably mentioned Josh Sims at some point, but similar yeah. kind of route for him and he's had a pretty successful loan spell at um Doncaster this season in the same division. So I think positive. Sims also had a, a decent uh run over here in, in MLS and um that that was one of those things where we were when he signed, we got in the car and drove to LA because Red Bull New York was supposed to be in, in LA and he wasn't on, we got down there and realized he wasn't on the team. She wasn't even on the plane. Um, so we, we just had to watch a, a match that was still enjoyable. Uh, Jeremy Orr and I made that, made that trip. That was fun, but um, you know, we didn't get to see him, but he, he, he really seemed to enjoy his time and he seemed to fit the system a little bit. And we were kind of all hoping that he comes in and, and, and maybe that would be his path back into the first team. And it hasn't quite happened yet. Um, I guess there's some links to him with, with QPR, which I'm sure uh, Charlie Austin will, um, you know, enjoy the service that Sims would provide from uh, that, that right-hand side, hopefully, but we'll have to just wait and see. Um, there are two now that I'm not sure I want to, to, to have happen. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't want these, these moves to go through. There's been some, some tangential links from Inlundalu to Bettis. Um, he seems to be, to me, too far ingrained in the team now and making too many appearances and especially with Obafemi out injured. Now uh, he seems to be the guy that would, we, we wouldn't seem to want to give him up even on loan to a team. If, if it meant first division football somewhere else. Yeah, I agree. I, th- I mean, he's an out and out forward. Uh, Teller is a kind of indirect forward. Teller to me still feels a little bit more like a Walcott, maybe a winger into a forward. Whereas Lundalu seems a logical next step. Um, if we need, someone to come in a bit more permanently. I mean, he seems to have been around for a few games now. He's only, I had a look before we started chatting, that I think he's only actually played 28 minutes off the bench. That's so it? Far, but yeah, 28 minutes. He played wow. 13, 13, I think, on Monday. But One of us does research here, apparently. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do some work. Um, but 
he's obviously made an effect because people are talking about him. And if he's being linked to Betis in Spain, he's made an impression. Uh, not least because my my wife is um, continuously mispronouncing his name, and it's a, an in joke in our family about how you pronounce his name, how many U's are in it. Yeah. But um, I've been really impressed with him, and he gets a lot of praise from Ralph when he's on the pitch. You can tell he's really up for the fight, as well as Teller is. Um, so I could understand possibly a loan move somewhere and somewhere fairly, you know, to a decent level. But um, I think you're right. I think he's too, he's too close to a possible start. I, I would have thought if the Shrewsbury game had been on um, this weekend, then that would have been a perfect opportunity to, um, to give him a start, a first start. So I can't, I can't, I can understand why he's linked with club because he's now in the, the kind of public consciousness, but he, he feels like he's the next guy off the block if there's a spot up front. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have to think he's, I, I don't want that to happen. I feel, like you said, that he's, he's due for a start and we, we still don't know when that, that Shrewsbury match will take place or if it'll take place or how it's going to happen. So we'll have to figure, figure that out, wait and see. Um, and then there's the comments from Martin Keown that you mentioned you heard. Uh, he said, given Liverpool's kind of defensive center back issues and, and, and things like that, they should sign somebody. Um, Neonic Vestergaard has been one of the best center backs in the league this season. Um, his, th- it's a guy that we almost, and I think most of us wanted to get rid of because we said, there's no way he fits. And I said it, uh, it was written about in, in, I, I think we just looked at the, the, the turning radius and, and the speed and, and everything else, but he's been so good this season in terms of passing the ball instead of uh, commanding the box being better. Uh, we actually have a threat from set pieces uh, now, which is, which has been great. And um, the partnership with, with the Ann has, has been fantastic. And because of that, of course he draws the attention of, of other clubs around. Um, and, and Martin Keown mentioned that, that maybe Liverpool need to sign him uh, he then did, as you said, apologize for, um, you know, he's not trying to get rid of him for us, but there's, there's this, this tired kind of trend of us going there and, uh, which just makes it all the better that, that Ings was the one who scored the goal against him the other day. Um, it did make me smile a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I can't see us getting, like, letting him go it, it the, the fee would have to be astronomical, um, it, which would make me smile if they paid more for him than they paid for Van Dyke, then maybe I'd smile and let that go because, uh, that would just do it. But I, I can't see it happening. I can't see Liverpool wanting to spend that much money on a center back anyway. Um, given that obviously they're, they have Van Dyke for that, 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 that position and they're not going to play the two of them next to each other. I don't think. I think what mine Keo may have done is stoked up the, um, the interest from best of guys agent to go in and knock on the door for a new contract. Yeah. And Mary, he could be the next one in the, uh, in the signing picture, I think, um, with that sort of speculation going around. Yeah, <clears throat> did did make me um, chuckle a bit thinking about last summer when probably most Saints fans were rubbing their hands about rumours about Leicester wanting to pay twenty five million for him, whereas now you know you're kind of talking about three times that plus. But he's been outstanding, so I think it's a real credit to him as a player and to Ralph and the coaches to developing him and giving him that kind of framework to work in in them. Um, you know, really turn in his best performances that he is being mentioned by national radio stations about possibly going to the champions. But I can't see it happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why, no. why he's integral, he's been integral to this season up to the point um, of where the injury came in. Yeah. It would, it would, it would shock me if, because especially because I don't think we have the depth there to be able to deal with that. So, um, I think something like that might frustrate Ralph a whole a whole lot, and and you would understand if there was some frustration if we're if we're giving away the players he's worked to develop and bring back into the team because Vestergaard was very much on the fringes for a while, and um, to see him come back in and and, and do that is is there. Um, okay, we 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 have a couple of of listener questions that we'll we'll jump through now. Kevin McGee asked this question. He says, "Tomorrow night the FA Cup will be made for the FA Cup draw will be made for both the fourth and fifth rounds." Um, you will obviously know the result of the draw by the time you hear this, but we're recording on Sunday, so we don't know. He says, will the draw influence just how seriously we take the cup? Um, and and there's, there are questions about this because we don't know if we're going to play the match against Shrewsbury or not. I mean, 
couple of things could happen. It could be rescheduled, um, but it would have to be now, midweek probably, because there's um, the next round is on Saturday, the 23rd of January. Uh, we have a match coming up on the 16th, and we have a midweek match against Leeds in the Premier League on the 20th. So that really only leaves, uh, I mean, they could put us in a situation where we have to play, you know, uh, Liverpool had that situation where they had to play a cup game and, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, the cup winners cup or champions of the world, something world cup of football. I don't know. Um, back to back games in whatever day, back to back days. So there could be one of those situations. And then, um, you know, we play again midweek against Arsenal. And then, so there's just not a lot of time to, to, to squeeze this game. And so it either happens soon, or I think Shrewsbury maybe has to, um, you know, forfeit and we go through. Um, but if, if, I mean, could the, the, the draw actually impact the way we, we view it based on our, our league standing and things like this. Also, we're out of the Carabao cup. We were at, we've been out of it forever. We've seen the impact of, of multiple games per week and what that's done to, our results, the more games we play, the worse the results get. Um, so, I mean, in your mind, does this have an impact as to how, how we potentially view the cup? Yeah, I think so. I was looking as well, um, Matt, even into February, because we've got the um, fourth round uh, of the cup on the 23rd or around the 23rd of January. Mm -hmm. And then the, the fifth round would be the 10th of February, which is a midweek. Mm -hmm. But we start February with a Tuesday night game at Old Trafford. Um, and then followed by Newcastle away, and it will be squeezed in, in that midweek between Newcastle away and Wolves at home. So right. it just it feels like too much. I think there's so much optimism and expectation now with the league position, and it's so open at the top, and we're still in the mix. Um, I think going back to what we were talking about, the likes of Lundelu and some of those players on the bench, it would be a perfect opportunity to give them a shout. If either if we play Shrewsbury and move through, or if we get, you know, if we get a bye for the next round, um, it's going to be a, a chance for squad rotation for Ralph and try out some players um, and, and bring players into the mix and give them a go. I can't see that he's going to. I can't see any way that he's going to go full on for the FA Cup and how that will benefit the long term aim of the club yeah. in terms of how much he's um, moved things on this season the possibility of Europe as well. Um, and as you say, we've kind of got a trend of where the, um, the fixtures stack up. Yeah. Things don't go quite as well. So um, if, it, if it happens, it's a bonus, I think, getting through those cup rounds. But I think it's a real chance for him to mix and match the side a bit, pushing some of those youngsters. Yeah, I think it's a chance for us to see guys like in Lindelou or, you know, and other, other things get, in, get into the team, get a little bit more of a, uh, of a starting role and see how they impact the game, you know, when they're in there for, you know, not for 15, 20, 10, eight minutes. Um, and that brings me back to, to Josh Sims a little bit. We, we saw the impact he can have off the bench, but yet when he started games, he's tended to, to drift a little bit and, and kind of go missing. And, and that's not a, a criticism of him. That's the result of being a young player, um, being asked to do a job that in a league that is much more competitive when, uh, everybody's got time to figure you out, you know, and, and if you're only coming on for eight minutes and your job is, Hey, run and get on the ball and, and put it in the box. Like, you know, a lot, people can do that for four or five minutes against, uh, you know, tired legs or whatever. It's different if you got to, uh, you know, have the whole game plan in front of you, um, from, from, from the very start. So, uh, Kevin also asks, he says, does the emergence of Tellen and Lindy Lou signal the end for Obafemi? Um, and I think this question was asked prior to the, the the injury so i think the injury might signal his his kind of end but he hasn't really i mean he's been criticized by ralph uh, obafemi has um for you know for, since kind of since ralph's been here that he's not quite um professional enough he doesn't quite take care of himself the right way he hasn't learned that second side of of, of the game that you got to do he doesn't do all the things that danny ings does i guess off the pitch um to kind of keep himself ready and you know he's young he you know hopefully he learns but um i mean do you, I, I guess they're they are all fighting for for those spots on the bench, and and this this could I guess very well um, be what spells him going elsewhere. And maybe it's maybe it's to Swansea, maybe it's to somewhere in the Championship or or you know League One. Um, but he's he's definitely got a a, a career, but he's going to have to make some changes. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. And again, it it would be satisfying from a 
kind of development here if he went away and he one day came back to this level, either, you know, back to us or he came back up with another team or help them back up. You know, Swansea is a, you know, it's a club on the up again. They've got a decent coach these days. Um, and they're, they're pushing it up to the top of the championship. So it's a decent level for even if um, he went to a club like that when he comes back from his injury. I think with over Femi, I think you're right. It, Ralph has called him out a few times, which isn't something that Ralph does a lot. Um, he had that high point, I think, he kind of kicked the door open a little bit at Old Trafford with that going injury time last mm-hmm. season. And people kind of sat up a little bit and looked at him, but he didn't kick on from there. Um, I think he's a different type of athlete than the others. He's very, let's say, top heavy. Mm-hmm. So he's quick and he's strong, but I don't think he's really as effective as he could be with that physique. Yeah. And maybe, you know, he just can't fit him in in that way. Whereas Adams is strong, mm-hmm. but mobile as well, mm-hmm. and takes up really intelligent positions. So I think you're right, it's feeling like over Femi is the one to move on with Inland De Lou now coming through. Yeah. And Teller as well. Um, and that's the sort of incentive you need to push on as a player. And I can't see that he's going to do that. He hasn't kind of proved that so far. So maybe a drop down in the division um, would be enough for him. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's inevitable. I'm not sure where he is contract wise over Femi. Um, I don't, I couldn't, I can't think that he's got, you know, too many, too much longer. I don't think he's out of contract at the end of the season. Maybe another season on top. But um, definitely a move I think will be in the offing uh, in summer it will be now to, um, to go out. I mean, the only other time he would go out earlier is if, he, if he's back from this injury and he can go to a, uh, a lower club because yeah. the transfer window is that a little bit longer for football league club. But um, I can't see him staying past this summer. And I think in that time, if um, things kind of work out, with, as we say, with the FA Cup, and if uh, and Linda Lou and Teller keep um, keep pushing as they are, there'll be fixtures in the squad for next season. You know, from day one. Yeah, well, I mean, he's he's still young, right? Like he's still, I mean, he's twenty years old. His his contract expires um, in twenty twenty two, so he's got a year and a half from now, which means that a year from now he'll be able to negotiate with teams um, and look for a move and move for free. Um, we don't often see Saints let players do that. So I guess if the, if he's going to go out alone and prove himself, this injury is really going to hamper that. You'd be hard pressed to see Saints tie him down to a longer term deal, uh, even a con- even a one or two year extension, um, just to see how he gets on. Maybe that's that's a, that's a possibility. But um, what what what's more likely is that you'd see him go out on loan, maybe over the summer now. And and potentially with a with loan option to buy or whatever, and, and but I, I don't know. You, you don't you, Saints don't often like to lose players for free. Um, they will pay to get rid of players. Um, you know, we we did that uh, twice. I think I think Jordy Classy. I think that that's what happened, and then I think also Guido Carrillo uh, had that option where we we came to some sort of agreement. Um, and and I I didn't understand exactly how it happened, but I did ask that question to. Uh, the Price of Football podcast, and they answered it and said, "Yep, they got to settle up that contract and sell them on, and that that's just the way it goes." Um, so we that Guido Carrillo probably uh, the biggest financial mistake we've made uh, in, in the past couple of seasons. So, um, oh well, I guess it's, you just got to water under the bridge now. He's gone. Um, just let it go. Uh, y'all, uh, we'll get over it eventually. Um, maybe maybe not financially, but we will at, at some point get over it. Um, so there you go. But um, Chris, I mean, do, do you have anything else that you'd like to, to bring up? Or uh, I think we've, um, you know, we've talked about a lot and, and some of it's directly related on the pitch. Some of it's kind of, you know, just off of it, but, but it, it's been a, I've been, in, I've enjoyed this and, you know, we'll, we'll see how much of it makes it into the show. Uh, how many of my mistakes get in there, but, um, I'll try to make, I'll try to make it sound a little smarter than maybe we came off initially, but, uh, thank you. But I mean, is there anything else that you, you anything you'd like to highlight before we we, we go? I think the kind of looming thing still, Matt, is whether football will carry on yeah. without a break. It's feeling day by day, and especially those uh, that article I mentioned about Steve Bruce yesterday yeah. in one of the uh, the big newspapers over here. 
uh, the Premier League as well is bringing in a lot of new restrictions in terms of um, they're, they're trying to cut down on the amount that players celebrate goals, the hugging, things like that. They're talking about that. Travelling to matches, they're talking about three coaches for the team to take players to space them out. Um, and also the subs are going to be uh, spaced out a bit more, so they're going to take even more of the, uh, the stand. They'd be up in the hospitality boxes <laughs> this way by uh, at St Mary's. So um, I think with those kind of measures, which I'm not saying it's getting to desperation times, but football kind trying to justify itself in this climate, yeah, um, is going to come to a breaking point, I think. And if the cases carry on up, um, and the unfortunate, the, you know, the, uh, the loss of life as well, um, ramping up as it is in this country, it does feel like there's going to be a time when football will need to stop at some point. But as we say, whether someone can step back and say, okay, the short break. Uh, will benefit us in the in the long term. That's that's the picture someone needs to see. I think. Just like all of us, I want us to continue playing matches. I want to see the team play. I, you know, I I look forward to to those those matches. Those are on my calendar and they're on my work calendar as well, which my boss doesn't always appreciate. Um, but it's it's something that I look forward to. And so to not have those would mean, especially when we're locked at home and and can't do things and. You know, you're, you're trying to find, you know, just something to get you through the day sometimes because that, that is a very, I mean, we talked about the outpouring of a positive emotion, but there's a lot of negative emotion that goes on right now too. There's frustration and um, people, I, I'm lucky I have, I have a family. I can, I have a, a yard that I can go out in and some people are locked in, you know, apartments in city centers and they can't do anything. And that, um, that's hard. And so to, to take that away from people is one thing, but um, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a big it's a big mess. And, it, uh, and I, I want to be kind of, I try to be thoughtful about all those things. And I obviously I can't, I can't do it all, but, uh, and, I, and I'm sure I'm missing th- something and d- don't understand things and things like that, but we'll see how it all kind of, kind of works out. And, and at the end of the day, it's the safety of everybody involved in, in the safety of all society kind of going on. And you talk about, you know, telling players not to hug after they score a goal, like, um, you know, good, good luck. I don't, I don't know how that, how that happens, you know? Um, but anyway, uh, if people want to follow you on Twitter, they can do that uh, at Hutch FM, correct? Yep, yeah. absolutely. You can uh, find out how many layers I'm wearing. Yeah, yeah. The various, yeah. Well, you, I mean, you look, you know, you look like you're warm today. It doesn't t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. There's a heater in the corner. Okay, well, there I mean, you go. I mean, <laughs> I I currently can't feel my toes, but that's going to change in about about two minutes when I walk. I walk that way, and it gets warmer. Um, get the coffee on again. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's it's going to be time. So coffee and edit, and uh, you know we'll get this out to the people. So, um, Chris, I just want to say thank you. It's a, it's a it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, and I want to say thank you again uh, for your support of the show um, as a patron, uh, and just you know the positive comments that come from you so often. Um, you may not know it, but it does. It means a lot to me as 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 they come in, and uh, you know sometimes we just need to hear those things. So uh, we'll do that. Um, and, and just wanted to tell people if you have comments or you have, uh, topics you'd like us to discuss, send them in, uh, quite a few emails this week from people, um, with some things like that and, and some other questions. And, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to get back to, to those of you. So, so thank you. And, uh, thank you, Chris, and, uh, have a good rest of the day and happy belated birthday again. And, uh, hopefully saints will give you another win next time we're on the pitch. Yep. Thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure as always. that does it for this week's episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Special thanks this week goes out to Chris Hutchings. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, even though there was no match to discuss and you had to maybe cut your birthday celebrations short to make sure that you were awake to do the show. Uh, that's, that is sacrifice, and I appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure the listeners do too. So I look forward to talking to you next time. And uh, hopefully next time we have a match to discuss and uh, a victory to discuss. And, uh, you know, you, you'll still also be warm, given that um, England is cold. And uh, to say that as a guy from California sitting here in shorts at uh, 7 p.m. on a Monday. Special thanks again goes out to all of you for listening. If you are enjoying the show, please do consider 
leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Uh, it really does help other people find out about the show, and I very much appreciate it. If you want to follow Chris, this week's guest, on Twitter, you can do that at Hutch FM. The links are in the show notes. There you can also find the links to our partner pages, both the Southampton page, who you can follow on Twitter, at Southampton page, and the Saints Archive, who you can get in touch with on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and at their website. All of those links are in the show notes. Would appreciate it if you gave them a follow and help support their work. If you'd like to help support this show, there are a couple of ways you can do that. You can follow along on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. We're at SFC, D-E-L-L underscore I-V-E-R-Y, on both Twitter and Instagram, and also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash SFC delivery. There are plenty of links that you can send to your friends. Just send them over to southamptondelivery.com. That is the best place to get links to past shows and also all those links on social media that I mentioned before. Patrons of the show, make sure this show continues. We just had to pay the bills for the hosting and things like that and uh, could not do it without you. So thank you for your monetary contribution. That helps make sure this show stays on the internet. Um, And uh, yeah, that's basically it. I just appreciate everybody listening. I want to say thank you to all of you for doing that. Um, All music for the show comes courtesy of the Free Music Archive at freemusicarchive.org. The intro song is Epic Song by Boxcat Games and the end of show credits that you listen to right now is Aim is True by Pottington Bear. The show logo is done by Matt Beeling of the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. Links to all of those are in the show notes. That does it for this week. We'll be back next time. Be sure to get us your questions and discussion topics. And until then, remember that together, we march on.